Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Each week, we hear real-time stories from athletes and CEOs on how to maximize performance through an endurance mindset. Let's get started. Welcome to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. I'm your host, Greg McDonough. Today's guest has spent the last three decades coaching and training high-achieving high entrepreneurs to build successful businesses. She has a passion for leadership and human potential and strives to inspire others to find their purpose. Founder and CEO of Discover the Edge, founder and podcast host of the Leaders of Transformation. Please welcome Nicole Jansen. Welcome, Nicole. Thanks, Greg. Great to be here. It's awesome to have you on the show. So we'd love to talk about endurance leadership. We love to talk about the endurance mindset. I would love to know, uh, how has your endurance mindset impacted your life unexpectedly? You know, um, endurance uh, and tenacity has been kind of a, a middle name for me. So, you know, it, it's actually been a foundation for um, uh, my success in every area because things just didn't come easy. You know, I had to work at it. And I grew up, my parents were entrepreneurs, uh, immigrants. They knew how to work hard. And uh, somewhere along the way, you know, I, I just, I saw them. Uh, I saw them struggle and fight through and get to the other side. And I just learned that that's what it took. And so over the years, I've had success and failure in business, in relationships, in various different areas of my life. And it's just always coming back to how do we get through this, right? It's the, the when the going gets tough, the tough get going. So I'd love to talk a little bit more about your parents and their entrepreneurial journey. Um, I have a very similar background as well. My parents immigrated from England back in the 60s and put out their shingle to get things started. And it was a lot of their life lessons that inspired me to push through my journey. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about what they did when they came over. Give us some a little bit of history there. Yeah, sure. Um, so my dad is from Holland and my, my mom was from Germany and they met here. And my dad was, um, he was a mechanic. And so he worked on, he worked on cars, he worked on boats and, you know, just really hard worker. He came here actually with like, I think it was $80 in his pocket. And uh, three days later had $20 and realized he had to get busy really fast. And so um, he came here, his, his brother was here. So my uncle was here already, but they didn't really get along, but he just knew somebody here and and so anyway, so he was here, he was kind of on his own and, uh, uh, he just, he just started getting whatever jobs he could. And, and at one point he was, uh, he was a cook. He was a, um, uh, a driving instructor. He was a taxi driver, t driving instructor and tra taxi driver at the same time. And so, uh, uh, and then he was also working on cars as well. And so just really, you know, starting out grow very grassroots. He met my mom. They got, uh, they got married, had a couple of kids and my dad had the opportunity to start a garage business or somebody wanted to offer like to help him and, and to give him that, that opportunity to, to help him buy it. And so he bought an SO franchise. I'm, I'm originally from Canada. So I was in Canada. And, uh, and, and they just worked hard seven days a week, gas, it was a gas station and an automotive repair. And my mom worked in the, you know, in the, in the area of the bookkeeping and doing all of that and doing the visa receipts, and the MasterCard receipts manually on Saturday nights while we'd watch hockey night in Canada. And, uh, they just worked hard. And then when I was seven, they started a home-based business, uh, actually an Amway business and network marketing. And uh, somebody had come in, asked my dad and said, you know, hey, you ever look at other ways of making money? And he's, you know, he's like, the heck do you think I'm doing here? So he, uh, it was always a straight shooter. So he, uh, he took a look at it. They, they got excited about it and they hit the ground running in that business. A couple of years later, my dad got um, the opportunity to invest in a project down in Brazil and by then, he had sold his SO franchise, went on and bought a Sunoco franchise, which was very successful, and uh, ended up selling that and putting the money into this investment opportunity. And it was in gold mines in Brazil, and it was going to be one of those, 
you know, game changers and building a fortune and so forth. And he researched and everything, flew down to Brazil and, uh, and, and, you know, was signing the agreement, had a bunch of other partners there and, and they all backed out after he signed the agreement. And so he, uh, uh, the Brazilians didn't care. They're like, I don't care, you know, what your partners are doing, but you've agreed to this. And so the contract, as far as we're concerned, is executed because there's a signature on there. And so they, uh, they wanted their money. And so that was um, uh, a bit of a problem because he didn't have it. And so uh, long story short, he ended up losing everything. And we, we didn't hear from him for a few months. He ended up showing up at our doorstep one day. And, and uh, I was about 12 at that time. And he had lost everything, had $250,000 of debt on his American Express card and, and uh, you know, starting over. And at the same time, the Amway business was, there was an expose on 60 Minutes, so that fell apart. Everything fell apart at the same time. And, uh, and it, was, uh, it was one of the uh, pivotal moments in my life to see not just that he had failed and, and, and lost everything, but to see him... Uh, who's normally larger than life being crushed and just his confidence really took a hit in that, in that, uh, and, and beating himself up for the decisions that he had made that had led to that. And so my parents started fighting and, uh, you know, and, and, uh, um, you know, through a series of events, they ended up having to work things out, which they ended up, you know, being married for 49 years and it was, you know, it was an amazing journey. Um, but it was a difficult, it was a difficult time. And so, you know, I learned resilience in those moments and not realizing that that would serve me later in my own business and, you know, uh, ventures that I would be part of and that even we would both be part of, because I actually ended up partnering with them in that um, uh, network marketing business later on and built it to a very successful point where when I was in my, my mid to late twenties, I thought that's what I was going to do for the rest of my life. We, you know, eight figure business, you know, it's all solid and vertical growth. And I thought that's what I was going to do. And it fell apart and various reasons, again, partners, you know, I remember one of my mentors saying, you can't do a good deal with a bad partner. And so we've had some bad partners and, but also taking responsibility. You can go and say, you know, I'm a victim, but there's also taking the responsibility of saying, okay, where, what's my part in this? You know, cause I, I'm here, you know, that <laughs> I'm the common denominator, all these things. So how do I, how do I, um, deal with that? So there was, a, there was a lot of lessons that we can unpack that further, but, um, I learned a lot along that, uh, along the way. And, and, uh, now what I do is help people to, you know, and business owners and entrepreneurs to kind of avoid Put themselves in the business. You're never going to avoid challenges. Life will give you challenges, but to avoid the pitfalls and getting stuck in those those valleys for for longer than necessary, and to really extract all the learning so that you can move forward um, and 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 use those step those those setbacks as stepping stones. That's a powerful story. Um, thank you for sharing it. I'm curious as you worked with clients now are there indications or signs that you see when a pitfall is coming or there's an obstacle or like you 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 know just explain these stories of these ups and downs as you look back were there any indicators that could have said hey wait a second let's slow down or let's speed up or let's go in a different direction that we're missed or we're i guess just missed yes Yes, I think that one of the things that my parents, who have now both passed away in the last few years, they they um, they were kind of loyal to a fault, and I appreciate that. And at the same time, that that also clouded their view of what was really going on. And so they were the. There's something about my dad was an eternal optimist. You know, my, my mother was a little bit more skeptical and would go, oh, you know, you got to watch out for this. She would start off with no and then build up to a yes. My dad was a yes. And, and that's great. And there was a great combination there. But somewhere in there, they, they didn't see the telltale signs. There's always telltale signs, right? That kind of say, hmm. And there's also, and I think this is where my, my, my BS meter is pretty dialed in. It's like this level, it, call it discernment you know, whatever you want to call it, but it's really just tuning in to what's happening and to trusting your gut in the process. So 
I can't speak as much to where my dad was at in in the first time around when that happened and um and but the second time around being partners with them I remember specifically saying this is not good. When you're partners so a lot of times it's like love is blind. We get so excited about something that we fail to to notice the telltale signs of maybe this person isn't exactly aligned with our vision. You can't do a good good deal with a bad partner. You can't do a, you know, uh, have something great happen if you're misaligned. At some point, that misalignment is going to show up. It's going to it's going to grow. That 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 one degree. You know, the the story about the the jet, right? If you're if you're if you're flying a, a plane or a jet to from one place to the other, they don't you know they don't go in a straight direction. It's like there's the one degree off, right? The you know the or the course correction, I should say. Um, but if you get one degree off, and you don't course correct you're going to end up in like florida other than you know rather than texas kind of thing right so the same way sometimes we don't pay attention to those one degree offs we don't we don't pay attention to those little those little yellow flags maybe not red flags but yellow flags so we're not aligned in our vision we're not aligned in our values that's a key one right i mean do you really have the same values as the people that you're in business with. It's like a marriage. You got to be on the same page. And if you're not on the same page now, it's not going to get any better later on. It's if anything it's going to grow, you know, further apart. And so it's really looking at that and and so for for I I think for for my my dad's experience in Brazil, the people that he was in business with, he looked at the business deal for what it was. The potential of it and saw the good parts of it, investigated and did, did, did his due diligence. But I don't think he actually did his due diligence on the people that he was going to be in business with because they didn't show up, right? And so second time around, they were in business with people that we were kind of stuck with because in that model, you can't really fire your upline. But, um, but it became, became very evident early on that our values were misaligned. And so what do you do with that? So their, their thing was, it'll all work out, right? It'll be fine. We'll be able to protect our people from it and all of that. But at some point, you know, it came to a head. And usually when you add a bunch of zeros onto the end, you know, and, it, and the more, there's more money in the table, that's, it doesn't, money doesn't change. I, I can't remember who said that initially, but I think it's very true, is that money doesn't change people, but it does reveal them. Right. It reveals that ego. It reveals that greed. And so those telltale signs of really understanding, like, who am I in business with? And it doesn't matter how good the deal is. If you have the wrong people on the bus or you have, you're in business with the, you know, or in bed with the wrong people, it's just not going to go. It's not going to go well. And so that was one thing. Um, the other thing was, I would say is that, um, when it started to go south, I remember saying, hey, we need to step up and take. So this is where our responsibility was, you know, to take leadership, to say, hey, we need to move this in, an, in another direction. And I think my parents were trusting so much that it would work out and, and, um, and just let it be. And, you know, there's a point where sometimes you do need to just allow things to unfold the way they are. But um, and, and trust, I think, is important. But there's also taking action in that trust. Like there's a, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, wait upon the Lord. And there's some of this misconstruction, you know, misconstrued conception of the fact that it's like, we're just sitting there waiting and waiting and saying like, he'll figure it out. You know, he'll take care of it. That's not actually what it means, right? It's like you can wait and you can trust. And in the meantime, you're leaning into it mm. and asking questions and digging deep into like, how can I move forward? What, do, what am I not seeing in this? You know, what do I need to see in this that I'm not, that I'm not uh, seeing or that I'm blind to? Ask yourself. I always say that the quality of your questions determines the quality of your life. What are the questions that you're asking yourself so that you can see both the, the positive and also, you know, the negative sides of the pros and cons? You have to look at both to be able to really get a full picture. A hundred percent. Um, I'd love to go a little bit deeper in this partnership conversation. When you, let's say we've got audience member who's about to get into a partnership for a business. 
what advice would you like? What questions should they be asking around core values and purpose to see if they are aligned? Like, is it, do you have a, an exercise or a, a worksheet that you kind of walk people through, or is there a, a couple steps that you'd recommend? Yes. So actually, it's funny. Years ago, as a, I'll give you a quick story. So years ago, there was a gentleman who is a real networker in Toronto, where I'm originally from. And and uh, he wanted, he's like, Nicole, I want to do something together. We're going to do some business together. And I said, okay. So we're on the phone. We're talking. And and uh, knowing my experience, like for myself, I'm kind of, okay. So like, tell me more about, you know, I wanted to get to know him a little bit more. Right. And uh, anyway, so at one point he says, you know, whenever I do a deal, I always make sure, and I'll leave his name out of it, but I'll just call him Bill, right? I always make sure that Bill comes first. I, I, you know, at the end of the day, I always make sure Bill comes first. And I said, and that is why we'll never do business. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, you just told me that if we're in a joint venture, you're going to make sure that you come first. I know where that leaves me. And so, you know, in terms of questions is, are your values aligned? You don't have to have the exact same values all the way down, you know, like all of that, because there are some, there's some, some differences in the way we approach life and so forth, but there are certain ones that are non-negotiable and there are the ones in the way, the way you operate together. I remember when I bought a franchise later on from Blair Singer and, and, uh, uh, and Blair, it was a it was a business coaching franchise, and he uh, and he said Nicole he, he called it a code of honor, and he said you know we have a code of honor, and that was something that he also taught and taught us and teach that and it's, it's important that every business have a have a code of honor every family has a code parents you know I'm, I should say uh, couples marriage you know uh, spouses and so forth have a code of honor anybody in relationship and uh, you know and it's the rules of engagement it's how you play the game. Anyway, so he said to me, he said, you know, Nicole, the assessments, like your, your, you know, you scored off the charts on the, you know, all of that. He said, and that's all great. So their competence was there, the alignment, skills alignment, and all that was there. But he said, um, we have a code of honor and this is the way we play the game. And if you are willing to commit to this code of honor, we'd love to have you part of the team. And if not, no problem. This is just maybe not the team for you. And the things that were on that code of honor were things like prioritizing mission first, team second, individual third, never abandon a teammate need, show up on time. What does it mean to be on time? It means being early, you know, taking responsibility, no blaming, finger pointing, uh, uh, you know, justifying all of that, right? Uh, personal development, commitment to for personal development. You know, these were things that were non-negotiable based on the game that they were playing, right? And so I think it's important for, before you're going into partnership, is to understand the game that you're playing, the mission, and then the rules of the game. If you and I are playing, I don't know, I'll take, what's your favorite sport? Soccer. Soccer. So we're playing soccer. You and my dad love soccer. My dad loves soccer too. Um, we're playing soccer. And we know that we're both playing soccer. That's the game. What do we also need to know to be able to be successful? We both need to know the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. Because if you are operating from a set of rules that are different than me, it's going to be a challenge. I'm going to be like, wait a second, that wasn't out. And you're going to be like, yes, it was. You can't do that. It's like, well, yes, I can. That's the way we always played it on our field at back home. And so... Having a clear and having an honest conversation, not trying to court at this point. Now, this is the real, how many kids do you want? How many, what, what, how do you parent? Same kind of thing, right? How do you play the game? And then we'll also, what are the, what are the roles you're going to play? So if you're going to part, you and I are going to partner in business. It's not so much, you know, let's say, we both have a similar strength. Great. Are we assuming that we're going to do the same thing? What are the roles going to be? What, are you, what role are you going to play? What role am I going to play? You know, if we're both playing soccer, we can't both play the same, the same position necessarily. Or even if we could, that wouldn't serve us very well, right? 
So it's just having those conversations to being honest. And, and what is your end game? Like, what do you really want to do? If you just want to go out and you and I just want to play soccer and have some fun. And that's your thing. Like, I just want to have fun today. And I come in and, and I'm like, I just, I got to win. Because I'm not happy unless we win the championship. We are also going to play the game differently. And so these are the types of questions there's, you know, questions around that to, to really understand, are you aligned in not just values, but in the approach to, to what that means? I love what Tony Robbins, he talks about what are your, your, your values in life? And then what are the rules on how you get those values met? Right. So like, you know, love is, is, is an interesting one or freedom is an interesting one, right? It's like people say, I want freedom. What does freedom mean? What I, I want to be loved. What does that mean? You know, it it could mean very different things. One person says, I feel loved if if you do A, B, and C. The other person says, that's not how I get love. I get love by da, 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 da. And then you have this mismatch, which you think about what, you know, the 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 percentage of divorces. A lot of it is because there's a disconnect, a misunderstanding. Both wanted love. But they actually understood, they expected, they have different expectations of what that would look like. In every business partnership, it's like there's different expectations. You know, if I look back on the, on the, on our, our partnership with my parents and, and the people that we were in business with, uh, one was like our goal was, our mission was serve as many people, help as many people get what they want. You'll get what you want. You know, you'll be, it'll work out. Right. So we were into service, right. And into making it, you know, uh, doing whatever we could to help people to be successful because we knew that that would we'd be taken care of in the process. The people we were in business with was like, I need the credit. I need the credit. I need the accolades. I need. And actually, if we would have worked together on that and agreed and said, this is what I need and say, hey, that's fine. I need, I care about this. But if we work together, we could actually have continued on very nicely. But when this person said, um, I need the credit and that means I need to get, you know, take you out, right? It's a zero sum game. Then it's like, oh, wait a second, that there's no space for me there, right? And now all of a sudden we start to compete, right? And, and, and to her, she, she said once to my mom, if I can't control you, I'll destroy you. And it's like, well, that's really hard to be in business with somebody when you're going to, when you're coming from that place, right? So. And Nicole, it comes back to, what you mentioned near the beginning of this podcast around the quality of your questions equals the quality of your life, right? If you're asking the right questions at the right times with that curiosity, much of this would reveal itself. So thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, shifting the conversation a little bit more to you, tell us your story from the partnership with your parents. And, and we've talked about that a little bit to what you're doing today. I'd love to hear some more about that journey. Yeah. So when, when that business fell apart, you can imagine it. I mean, my parents were devastated, um, not only from the financial standpoint of losing everything, uh, trying to hold on to it while it was just like basically seeping to, you know, sifting through our fingers, um, but all the relationships and all of that. And so I didn't want to rebuild in that industry. And there's some great things and qualities about that industry. I just personally didn't want to do it. My dad had already retired and they, because we had replaced the income from, he had at that time three businesses, um, three uh, garage businesses. Um, and so we had, we, he was out of that business. And so this is, was, was the, the, the golden goose, if you will. And the golden goose died. So, you know, it's like, okay, what are we going to do? I didn't want to rebuild that. So I was like, what do I do with this? So I went, and I spent uh, some time just looking at it and saying, okay, first of all, what are my, what, uh, what are my strengths, my natural strengths? What do I love to do? Um, my passion and what are my experiences and what can I, what can I take from all of that? I learned a lot on the way up, but I learned even more on the way down, you know, having a, a business. I mean, the things that I was able to do even at a young age was just amazing, right? I mean, here I'm 19 years old. I'm writing checks for a hundred thousand dollars back then in early nineties for a hundred dollars, a hundred thousand dollars a week. And, you know, and, and it's just like, I'm just go, I didn't think anything of it. Right. It just, it, it, you know, it was just, I wouldn't let my 14 or 16 year old, uh, niece run my business, 
you know, at that age, but I was running their business, you know, the back end of their business at 14, also doing it for our upline. At that point, they traveled and were in, in the U.S. for six months out of the year. And so, was, you know, I just the experiences that I had the opportunity to get. So I, I extracted out of that pain, I extracted all of the, the, the blessings, the gems that I could, that what could I, what could I glean from that? And then from there, I looked at this with the analogy of the game. I said, okay, well, what game am I playing now? What game do I want to play? You know, what is my, what is my passion? And so as I, as I identify that I love to see people win, I love to see people successful. I remember seeing people on stage and, and, and sharing their stories. And what was the thing that really touched my heart was seeing them shine, seeing them thrive. And in that, I was like, what is it that's really the, the core of that? It's when people are, are, are stepping into all that they're like their potential and who they're capable of being. And so I was like, okay, if that's the game I'm playing, helping people to maximize their potential, what's my role in that game? And so I asked, you know, am I, am I the head coach? Am I the like cheerleader? Am I on the team? Am I, am I, what am I doing? And so I created out of that, I created Discover the Edge which was helping people to play to their strengths, discover and play to their strengths. And it was a training and development company. And, and uh, because I felt that was the best way that I could, I could help people to do that. And then as I was doing workshops and trainings and so forth, teaching personality dynamics, people started coming up to me and saying, can you coach me? You know, and initially I was like, nah, I'm not a coach, like a, you know, therapist. Um, but I was like, no, 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 just, do the workshop. So I thought training and development was the way to do it. And then as I was going, people were asking me for this one-on-one -on -one coaching. So then I started to coach one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, and then, as I said, later on, as I, w um, as I got, as I would go into businesses, I would see that there was these personality dynamics and helping them maximize potential, the human potential of individuals and the team. Also realizing, though, that there was these other things that were going on in the business and systems and operations and all the things that I'd been doing in our businesses. And along the way, also other people had asked me to have previously to come in and help them with their business. I just realized that that maximizing gift was playing out in many different arenas. And so I said, hey, you want some help with that? Started to business, you know, uh, coach them and and then the later bought the franchise and so forth. And, and that franchise another uh, great experience. Um, I, I call it that, but I was, uh, Blair is amazing. And, uh, and, but his partner actually wasn't the greatest at building relationships, managing people and, or building a franchise. And so I ended up walking away from that franchise, losing my investment, walking away five years later um, after being burned out of several times and just trying to make it work. Um, uh, walking away from that and, um, and then, you know, went back to building my own brand and, and, uh, you know, and, and went from there. And then I launched the, the podcast in 2015, um, during a season, a very difficult season in my personal life where my husband was, you know, trying to figure himself out and didn't want to be married and all that. And so here I create this, this podcast, um, that was like really a divine download and had the opportunity to talk to amazing people. Uh, that's why you and I are talking, right? Is really through Chase. Chase, I met through uh, Damiano. I met through pod, a podcast. I met Chase through someone else who I met through someone else. You know, like that's, and it's just been amazing the people that I've been able to meet uh, through that. And it's just leveled up the, so it's like every, that's why I say it's, you can look at them as step, uh, uh, setbacks or you can look at them as stepping stones because mm -hmm. each one of those things I learned from that. And then I just, stacked on the the lessons and just continued to uh, evolve my coaching, my training, and the impact that I was able to make based on all of the failures, basically just walk, like building on all of those failures and, and successes along the way. There's, there's been those as well, of course. I mean, do you have a favorite story around personality dynamics? You know, you walk into a, a new client or you see two people and you think one thing and the opposite actually sort of comes true as the personalities come through? You know, personalities, because I've been using it literally for like 40 years. I actually first discovered personalities um, reading a book that I was like about 11 and I'm 51 now um, was to understand my dad. 
because I thought my dad's whole goal was to drive me crazy. Um, because I, I was like, I grew up in a household. So I guess it was maybe the, the safest and, uh, for protect the innocent, uh, the safest example is using my own family is growing up. Um, my, my dad, my brother is older than me, he's three or three and a half years older, and my mom, all strong personalities and myself being a strong personality too. But I'm the youngest and I remember standing in my kitchen and saying, uh, why is everybody bossing me around all the time? When do I get to be, you know, when do I get to be the, be the boss and when do I get to be right? I wanted to be like, cause everybody was always, you know, I was wrong or real right. And, uh, and so my brother turns to me and he says, well, you're the youngest. So you're, that's never going to happen. You know, <laughs> I was like, well, great. And somebody bought him a shirt saying I'm the boss. And I was like, who is that person? I want to strangle them because he literally took that to heart. And so he was, he was a strong personality. My dad, he was just like my dad. So, um, you know, personality wise, very dominant and uh, we're using the DISC model of human behavior. It's dominant and inspiring. So we're going to have fun, but we're going to have it my way. And so I, I literally thought his whole goal in life was to drive me crazy. When I read the book, it, it was like an eye opener to me that I was like, oh my gosh, this is not personal to me about like he's literally waking up every morning and saying, how can I push her buttons? It was, and of course I grew up in a European household, so you can't say anything. You know, you just gotta, you, you know, you know, respect your elders. And so, um, it was a huge eye opener for me to realize that it was his personality because I also had a certain strong personality and wanted to, to, um, you know, lead and be in charge. And so that's where the conflict was. It was also the conflict between my brother and my dad. Um, and life has a way of paying you back. So we laugh because his daughter now, uh, is like that. And so when we watched her grow up and my mom's like, this is total pay payback. So, but it's, you know, we, we laugh about it, but it's that strong personality where we would fight against each other. And so, um, it, you know, it, and then my mom, my mom being like, so my, my dad was the DI personality. My, my mom was the DC personality. I'm more the DC, the little bit of I, my brother was the DI and I used to be the referee. And uh, I was had to bring in the S personality, which is the supportive type. The C personality is the cautious type. But I had to bring that supportive type to kind of referee everybody and be like, "Okay, everybody, calm down." And uh, and it's and it was um, uh, very very valuable. It's one of the most valuable lessons that I've ever learned uh, or skills that I've developed is the ability to understand and relate to different personality types. And um, so it's. Uh, it's, it's, there's many, many other stories, uh, you know, where it's, I've had people say, uh, you know, that, uh, they, you know, like, even like, just like they've come up to me in workshops even, you know, and here I am talking to financial analysts, you're in finances, you know, it's like these financial analysts and critical thinkers and so forth. And then, you, you know, I've put it in the context of their, 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 their industry and their career and, corporately how they relate to people and they come up to me afterwards and say oh my gosh you just explained to me why my son is this way and why i'm that way and how we're not seeing eye to eye and that is so rewarding to see that what was the title of the book so um that first book was called personality plus by florence the tower i actually don't recommend that one i recommend now um the um uh positive personality profiles i got trained through uh, Personality Insights, Dr. Robert Rome, R-O-H-M, uh, great mentor for me and uh, just a dynamic individual. And that book, because that one uh, focuses on the DISC model, the other one was about like choleric sanguine and, and um, uh, the DISC model of human behavior. And one of the things I love about the way Dr. Rome um, teaches it, and he's been teaching it for decades now, um, is uh, I think since 1991, he's got five degrees. Um, education, communication, and so forth, is the way that he teaches it is that it's easy to understand, it's easy to remember, and it's easy to apply. Because the tool, if you can't remember it, under, understand it, remember it, and apply it, it's really useless, right? So it's very important to have a tool. So you can literally ask yourself two questions when you meet somebody and say, 
Like what is, where is their, where do they tend to go? It's not about stereotyping or pigeonholing. It's about where do they tend to go? And you can ask yourself, are they more outgoing or more reserved? Second question is, are they more task oriented or more people oriented? By asking yourself those two questions, you can get a quick sense. Sure, there's assessment tools out there and everything, but you can get a quick sense really quickly as to where this person is, how they're showing up in that moment and how you can tailor then from, from the understanding of it is the communication um, that is going to most work most effectively, effectively with them, what their motivational styles are, um, you know, uh, drivers of behavior and all that. That's fascinating. Really, really fascinating. I have to ask you this question. What was the, what has been an unexpected benefit, unex, your podcast, what has been an unexpected benefit from podcasting? So in that season, in 2015, when I was like, literally, God, what do I do? Because I'm emotionally drained right now uh, from the relationship issues. Um, I, uh, I just didn't have the energy to put out my own content. And that's really where that, that came from was that I had this inspiration, you know, I woke up and I was like, you're gonna do this podcast. And I was like, okay. So I went and did it. And so the, um, the surprising benefit of that was not only was I able to connect to people in my network, I, I, I was, I've always been a good networker and, and knew a lot of people, but to, to reach out to them in that season where I was having a, a very difficult time and change the environment. So I got to have conversations with, you know, transformational leaders that I previously knew and reach out to them and have a purpose for that conversation. And then they referred me to other people and then booking agents started sending me uh, guests to speak to. And so it actually changed, you know, we are the five people we hang around with, the sum total of the five people we hang around with. I changed the environment because I was isolated a bit, had moved 3,000 miles and now I'm sitting there by myself going, what the heck? You know, and to to be able to connect to those people, um, and it gave me the shot in the arm that I needed at that point to remind myself of who I am and the environment and the conversations that I like having. Because I felt at that point, I felt like in LA, it was like I was in the wrong place at the wrong time with the wrong people and the wrong conversations. It just felt out of place. Because in fact, I was out of place. Because I, I was hanging, you know, I was meeting people and I was, because I was in crazy land, I was meeting crazy. I'm not saying LA, I'm saying is emotionally, like dealing with this disruption. I, we attract who we are, not what we want. So I was attracting a lot of like clients were crazy. Everybody was crazy. I mean, it was just like, what the heck is going on here? I'm not into drama. How did I end up with all this? And so I had to step out of it, you know, and, and regain my footing. And, and one of the things that helped me to make that shift back into the mindset that I had before and the success mindset, growth mindset, and, and impact and so forth was having these conversations on my podcast, showcasing other people, not even my own content, just showcasing other people and serving first. And as a result of that, I've just been amazed at how many people I've met. The people that have come to be on my show, it's just like, I would never have had these conversations or met these people before. It's amazing. You know, I mean, Vishen of Kiani is the founder of Mount, uh, Mind Valley, reached out a few years back on LinkedIn or his assistant did as posing as him. I don't know, but um, said, hey, I'd love to be on your show. And I'm like, you know, if I didn't have a podcast, that would have never happened. You know, right. John Demartini from The Secret, you know, reached out, hey, you know, or his agent reached out and say, we'd like to have John on the show. Would you be interested? I'm like, yeah, you know, and just the amazing conversations that I've been able to have, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure. It's powerful for sure. Uh, Nicole, how can an audience member get in touch with you? Uh, Leadersatransformation.com is the easiest way. Yeah. Fantastic. And we'll put that in the show links along with the other materials that we've talked about, the book and some other links. Nicole, it's been awesome having you on the show. I really enjoyed um, part of our conversation when we started talking about flying an airplane. And if you're one degree off and you don't course correct, next thing you know, you're going to be in Florida instead of Texas. We talked a lot about values and the misalignment and how that affects your partnerships and and really understanding the rules of engagement. Because if, if your rules are different than my rules, the game is going to be played differently and we're going to be misaligned. You've been a wonderful host, excuse me, um, wonderful guest. I've really enjoyed our conversation. 
uh, to the audience members, if you've gotten value out of our show, we ask that you like it. Please share this with your community. Please find us on LinkedIn and the other social media platforms of choice. Again, Nicole, it's been great having you on our show. Thanks, Greg. It's been great being here. Thank you for tuning in to the Chief Endurance Officer Podcast. To hear more inspiring stories and strategies around the endurance mindset, be sure to subscribe below or visit us at chiefenduranceofficer.com. Until next time, keep pushing those limits.